Welcome to part six. In this broadcast series on what is love, Mark DeJesus here, looking forward to sharing some more about the beauty of God's love for us, what it looks like to process it in our lives, and what it looks like to live it out and experience it more and more. What are we looking for when it comes to understanding love? And I look forward to just exploring this and discovering this with you more and more, and I pray it's a blessing to your life and to your journey. If you've tuned into any of my previous episodes, you've definitely heard me emphasizing that love is something that is very deep, very relational. It is so important. God is love, and he wants to manifest his love in how we do relationships. But we got to grow in it. We got to understand it. And a lot of our brokenness and emptiness and areas of neglect and pain have caused the definition of love to be a bit fuzzy, if we're all just honest. If everyone's really honest, we realize we need to grow in what love is. And many people who write to me say, Mark, help me understand what is love. It's quite a challenge because I myself, I'm on, I'm on my own journey of discovery and learning and I'm looking to God's word and allowing myself to grow in it. But something that I've discovered right off the jump is this concept that love is multifaceted. And I use a picture of a diamond to illustrate it because many times in our season, we learn a facet of love. And it's amazing. It's absolutely beautiful, life-changing. But then we turn the diamond and we see another beauty. We see another amazing and beautiful facet. And it causes us to just continually grow in the multifaceted aspect of God's love. How deep it is, how rich it is. And so today, I pray that what you will take away from this broadcast is the invitation to go deeper. And I'm going to use this scripture as a launching pad into the rest of what I'm going to share with you here. And that is Philippians 1.9. I have found this scripture of to be so helpful for me, to be so insightful. And I love when I read scripture, I make sure I pay attention to certain words. Many times I look them up and let the meaning digest in my system. Because the Bible emphasizes in our new covenant walk with Christ and learning to relate to the Father and receive the comfort and empowerment of the Holy Spirit. Grace and love are so important. And love, when it's emphasized, it's emphasized in its growing work and its overarching nature in everything in our life. And the importance of it is so critical. And in Philippians 1.9, Paul says this in his instruction. He says, and this I pray. So he's directing a specific prayer to the body of Christ. And the target is this, that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and all discernment. So he says, first, I pray your love is going to abound. That word speaks of to exceed a fixed number. It's an abundance, a super abundance, overabundance. Like just, just I want to see when I look at your life, that love is just flowing powerfully. And people are experiencing it. They're growing in it. And it's a very marked pit place of fruit over your life and those that you fellowship with, those that you live with, those that you rub shoulders with, that you grow in this. I don't know always in Christianity that our number one goal is that we grow in love. Quite frankly, because in many situations, it gets very challenging, and we don't know what it looks like. And many times we give in to distorted or dysfunctional versions of love. We fall into certain ruts and patterns, and many times what we are up against is God is wanting to grow us deeper into what love is. There may be a facet we've not come into learning and growing in that we need. And so Paul says here, this abundance, this overflow, this exceeding work of love. And he says more and more. It is accomplished through growing in knowledge and growing in discernment. So these two words I pay attention to here, because this word knowledge is talking about, I want to grow in a precision and a correct knowledge of what love is. Because for many of us, we grew up with certain understandings of what love is, and they got distorted because of where love was compromised or love was not 
experienced in a healthy way. So we develop incorrect understanding of what we think love is. So I have to be able to learn what the true thing is so I can identify the counterfeit. I got to learn, okay, this is what love really is. So when I see the counterfeit aspects seeking to become a part of my journey, I learn to grow out of them. And so but how do I do that? Well, I need the second word, discernment. I need the ability to discern how love operates in a given situation. That word can also mean judgment, the ability to judge in a moment, okay, what's needed here? What's needed to grow in this? And so this passage of scripture caused me to realize that love doesn't look the same in every situation. Love isn't just a broken record in one track saying the same thing all the time. Although these facets are there, we have to also grow in other facets and mature. What's needed in all this? Well, if you look from both the Old into the New Testament, what's needed to grow in love is wisdom. And the number seven precept that I want to bring to you today is that love calls for us. It calls for us to grow in wisdom. It calls for wisdom to mature in love. It is very important that we learn to mature in what love is. And we need wisdom to do that. My primary thesis for today is that love has a certain look that is needed in a given situation. It doesn't just look in one way all the time. I'll give you some examples. Sometimes love needs to speak the truth of what is needed. Still being peaceable, still showing the fruit of the Spirit, but needs to speak. Other times, love needs to stay silent. Shut your mouth. Stay out of it. Don't say anything right now. Sometimes love says, you need to take action. Don't, for example, in the Bible, it talks about if you see someone in need and you just tell them, oh, have a nice day, that's a problem. And you have the ability to help them. Help them. If, you know, you, you have some money and someone you see who is genuinely in need and they're interacting with you and you say, oh, okay, I hope things work out. You know, there's maybe something else of love that we need to grow in understanding to take action. There are other times where in love, we actually need to just wait because we can tend to follow compulsions. We can tend to follow guilt. We can tend to follow certain obsessions and we actually need to learn to wait. There are times where love calls us to embrace tighter into our relationship world, get closer, get closer to commune, to fellowship, to connect closer. There are some situations where the power of love is leading you to, it's time to let go. For the example of like an abusive relationship where you have to, in the, and this is an act of love. Love requires at times that we keep working through the difficult conversations instead of just avoiding them. Love, at times, causes us to move into new seasons. But it always, in wisdom, grow us deeper in how it manifests. Deeper in patience. Deeper in kindness. Deeper in maturity. Love grounds us in our emotional world. We're not so reactive. We learn to get balanced out, right? So this is what I'm talking about. We need wisdom to identify what's needed in this moment. I got to grow in the wisdom in order to grow in wisdom, I need to connect to maturity, my, the maturity of my journey, because love continues to expand. It continues to increase. Now, I think it, we're all honest. We realize we all begin with an immature and undeveloped perspective of love. And this is okay. This is okay. Don't beat yourself up. We're called to mature in it. We don't start off with a maximum understanding and capacity for what love is. It, and, and folks, we're always growing in it. We never arrive. It's always a process of continuing to grow in the endless depths 
of the love of God. But let's be honest, we start off with very immature definitions of what love is. I remember years ago when I was a youth pastor, many times parents would say to me, oh, my, my son says he loves this girl, or my daughter says she loves this boy. Oh, they're just, they're in this puppy love. And sometimes in conversation, I would say to them, well, I know that we're looking at this and saying it is puppy love and it's very immature, but puppy love is love to a puppy. So it is important that we meet people where they're at. No need to put people down in areas where their sense of love is immature, but God meets us where we're at. There's no question as I brought about in the first areas of love, it's an invitation for connection. And so I want to share before I get into anything else, that always is maintained in the process of growing deeper in love. But I'm sure many of you thought when you were growing up that, oh my goodness, I'm in love. And then later on in life, you look back and you chuckle. <laughs> to that moment where maybe... A girl gave you a kiss on the cheek or, you know, you had that, that someone wrote you a little love note. Do you like me? Check yes or no. And you look back at that and you recognize with probably a little bit of a smile and laugh. Oh, it's cute, right? Now, we don't need to look down on that. There's just a need to grow deeper. In fact, many of us don't have sometimes those innocent, even childlike experiences of relationship. Because of trauma and drama in our life and upbringing, we get thrusted into the seriousness of life. And we lose the innocence and simplicity of just being vulnerable like a child is. That's why Jesus said, if you want to enter into the kingdom of God, you've got to, you've got to approach as a child, arms wide open, willing to be vulnerable, willing to explore, willing to trust. And our brokenness in life begins to chip away at that, doesn't it? And doesn't allow those immature areas to get developed, to grow in. And so my invitation to you, my invitation to me, is we need wisdom to grow deeper in maturity. And the scripture tells us, you know, we're needing knowledge, we're needing discernment. You need to grow in what love is. And you need to grow in discerning how love operates. Grow in the knowledge, grow in the discernment. And I would propose to you today, that means growing in wisdom. And so this wisdom helps us to look at, in a given situation, what's needed for love. When you're looking at a crisis or a moment, a conflict or a situation, or you think about a person, you have to realize love doesn't look the same in every single circumstance. This is not just a cookie cutter robotic thing. This is relationship. And relationships have complex issues and things and journey and history and story and nuances and emotion and all these things, right? Many times people don't mature because they may remain stuck in a broken record of one track of a distorted aspect of love. I'm going to say that again. Many times people don't mature in love because they remain stuck in a broken record track of one distorted facet of love that just kind of keeps playing and playing and playing. And sometimes people say, well, we just need to love people and just accept where they're at. And it causes them to maybe not want to make any decisions. There are times, well, oh, just love people. And that definition turns into that that means saying a certain lifestyle is okay or saying certain things are okay when they're wrong from a biblical standpoint. Now love still has the ability to see people through compassion. But many times we get stuck on certain tracks where, oh, let's just love people, but for them it's a broken record of they never have truthful conversations. They never get honest. So therefore they never grow deeper and have a surfacey relationship with everyone. You see, in one setting, love speaks honesty, the truth, in another setting, love says, you know what, we're not going to speak right now. We're just going to be quick to listen, slow to speak, and therefore slowing to being angry. I want to manifest the fruit of the Spirit more than anything else. In another setting, there may be a much bigger emphasis on just listening. 
I think we have a long way to go in just learning to be active listeners in a safe way to hear people's hearts and relate to them peaceably and allow them to feel safe. We're all pilgrims on a journey and we're in progress and process, right? To be able to have nurture, love and wisdom helps you to tune into what does this person need right now? Love in wisdom tunes into what is needed in a given moment. What does this person need? I find in my personal one-on-one work, in my relationship world, the greatest place of fruitfulness is tuning into what is really needed in this moment. Now, the journey of wisdom, sometimes we have to cut past all our brokenness and, and our protective layers and our assumptions that we make, right? Part of our immaturity is we make quick assumptions. We make quick answers, quick thoughts. And our discernment, I use air quotes when I say discernment, is often hair trigger responses of immaturity. And a lot of times we don't grow in wisdom because we are still very immature in how we're dealing with our own lives. How do we grow in this wisdom? How do we grow in the depth of this? And that's what I'd like to get to. Because one of the signs that love crumbles, if you look at society and you see love getting distorted or you see love being absent, love being compromised, love being uh, um, ignored, if you see certain legalism or certain abuses or you see just a moral collapsing, there's an absence of wisdom. There's a pushing away of true wisdom. Many times what I do when I help people to understand wisdom, because I like to keep things simple. There are people way smarter than me in these areas, but I like to keep things practical. What is wisdom? Well, really, it's knowing how to use knowledge in a given situation. You may be super smart, know a lot of things, but do you know how to activate it in a given situation to experience it, to manifest it in that moment? Because many times people will say, well, I know about truth, and so they feel at every moment they speak the truth. I remember times where I would just go on these rants of certain things that I felt needed to be said. And looking back, wisdom would say, you know what? I should have just sat back and listened more. Or I look back at a given situation and say, you know what? There was not a gentleness about me. There was an intensity. Many times our anger takes over, right? And that anger can sometimes reveal, hey, there's a some maturity we need to grow in, in what love means, so that we can manifest the peaceable nature of God that invites us in to healing, freedom, and transformation. In the book of James, James wrote about wisdom, and he differentiated from a wisdom that's from above and a wisdom that is below, and he contrasted that. And we have to realize there is a fake wisdom, a wisdom that has feedings of the enemy, a a wisdom that James said is earthly, it's sensual, it's demonic. And we have to understand it presents itself, but it's as truth, but it's counterfeit. And there's some things that are very interesting that help us to realize when we're walking in love and we're carrying wisdom, what does it look like? Now, I plan on expanding more in James writing, but I want to specifically look at James 3, 17 and 18. This is in the New American Standard Version. It brings out some words here that are helpful for my talk today. It says, the wisdom from above, we say, well, what's the wisdom from above? That's heaven, from God. What is it? It's first pure. There's a purity about it. So it's not not compromising. There's a There's a beauty of God's purity flowing, but it's peaceable. So even though there's a purity, there's not this thing that's like trying to create strife and war and trying to stir things up and get strife kicked up. And a lot of our disagreements and a lot of things, do you notice that strife takes over? And James says, where there's strife, there's every evil thing. We open up a box that just unleashes all kinds of evil when we let that strife take over. Wisdom is realizing purity is manifesting, but there's a peaceability. The person's at peace. They look for peace. They draw people into peace. They invite people 
into peace. There's a gentleness about them. So when they interact with you, you get that sense of emotional groundedness. And then there's this word reasonable that the New American Standard translates. Other translations might say will a willingness to yield to. I think in the demonic wisdom, what people lose is reasonability, the ability to sit down and reason with each other. I'm very grateful that God in his word in the Old Testament through Isaiah the prophet makes this statement. He says, come now, let us reason together. Though your sins are as scarlet, they are as white as snow. God looked in the midst of evil and rebellion and sin And his response is an invitation to reason. God has every right to act towards our sin in a certain way, but he's willing, even under an Old Testament context, he's still willing to be reasoned with. And I think one of the things that is being lost in the loss of wisdom of love is we lose our ability to sit down and be reasonable, to hear one, to hear one another out, to listen to be able to have conversations, to learn from another person, to hear them out and maybe enhance. And maybe what we're saying is true, but the way we go about talking about it needs some sharpening. And we're not reasonable. We're not gentle. We're not peaceable. This doesn't mean that you just get run over by everybody. Don't get mistaken. The apostles were not pushovers. But it was through the manifestation of a reasonability, gentleness. You can be incredibly strong, walk in power, yet at the same time carry a humility and a reasonability and a fruit of the Spirit. He says you're reasonable, full of mercy. So what does that mean? That means that you're willing to extend love in the midst of suffering where where there, where there could be just a heavy condemning consequence that's being lashed out. You're willing to lean towards mercy. And there's good fruits, unwavering, and without hypocrisy. All these things can like learn the depth, right, of what wisdom can bring about. And the seed whose fruit is righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. We could go into such lengths there. The wisdom that is being shown here, and it's displayed in the New Testament and the Old Testament. The more you grow in wisdom, the more you will be able to contrast it with foolish thinking, foolish activity. And I want to bring this precept home to you. Wisdom will help you to recognize in a moment when you're dealing with a fool. And a fool often manifests the inability to be reasoned with. The inability to grow, to hear, to learn, to humble themselves. They're not teachable. And wisdom will often help you to realize what love looks like in this situation is you don't need to feed this anymore. Because many times we try too hard. We say, maybe I need to share more, say more. Maybe I need to send him a book. Maybe I need to give him Mark's teaching. I should send him a link to one of his videos. Maybe I should say this one more thing. Maybe I should do that. Maybe I should do this. And if you fall into that, you may need to step back and say, am I dealing with a fool? Because if I am, then I am wasting energy after energy. People say, well, no, 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 we still need to love, and we still need to love. And then we fall into the worldly, foolish patterns of extending our energy over and over and over and over again. Sometimes we need to look and, is this person willing to be reasonable? And extend an invitation. I believe we as believers should extend invitations of wisdom to be reasonable, willing to yield. I'm willing to listen to you. I'm willing to hear. I think we would have some phenomenal discussions, even about theology or even about disagreements of certain passages of scripture and doctrine and things like that. If we were able to sit down and listen and be willing to be reasoned with. It's interesting, right? Are you willing to be reasonable? Are you willing? Are you a person who, where you go, you sow peace by the wisdom that's flowing through your life? We can identify fake wisdom by the manifestation of fools not being willing to reason with. 
James writing, you can read James 3 for yourself, where he talks about the strife and the envy and the combating that goes on and the arguments that just kick up. James basically describes the world we're living in today. And if we're going to cut through effectively, we must learn the ways of love, but we must learn to apply it in wisdom. There are times where you will notice in wisdom, what you are calling love is really codependency. And you need to break some codependent patterns. Wisdom will lead you in discernment to growing in what you call love might just be avoiding the tough issues and the tough conversations. Wisdom could help you grow in recognizing that what you call love is you steamrolling into a room and just telling people whatever you feel you need to say and then not having any regard for how you came across or the timing of what was said. See, we grow in wisdom. We begin to understand the depth of love. We grow in the maturity of it. The more we grow in our age, we should grow in wisdom. But just because you're older doesn't automatically mean you carry wisdom. Now we say, how do we understand the grid for growing in wisdom? What I invite you into is I want to give you the fundamental area of how wisdom grows in our lives. And it's found in the book of Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 4, we, we recognize Proverbs is known as the wealth of wisdom, as the place of wisdom. And so what I want to do is I want to look at love, the need for wisdom so that you grow in what love means and you are continually upgrading and going deeper into love. But I also want to get into the foundation of why we struggle with wisdom. And I will give you the reason up front. Wisdom in love starts with father and mother. They are the ones that set the template for wisdom being developed into your life. Now, we as sons and daughters have the ability to choose to accept this or reject it. But the beauty of love, relationship, and bond builds the wisdom And Solomon was able to recognize the ability he carried to have dynamic wisdom and be able to know in a given moment how to execute what was needed in a given situation. His ability to carry that wisdom, to know what does love look like in a given situation. It went back to his relationship with his father, went back to his relationship with his mother. And so in Proverbs 4, I'm going to actually read through the proverb. He says, Hear, my children, the instruction of a father, and give attention to no understanding. For I give you good doctrine. Do not forsake my law. And so he's bringing out here, there's some instruction you're going to need because it's going to be important for your life. Pay attention to it. You're young right now, so you'll think, ah, but I want you to pay attention because it's going to be important. And how does that happen? In verse number three, when I was my father's son, tender, and the only one in the sight of my mother. I don't want to move on without emphasizing the importance of being the delight of your father and mother. Wisdom is often birthed in the love relationship of a father and the love relationship of a mother. Listen to his reflection that he was, I was my father's son. There's a, there's a sense of belonging. This is my father. I'm his son. I belong to him. There's a connection here. I have a bond. This is beyond just, I am the biological son of my father. He's speaking deeper than just genetic DNA, or I am a biological offspring. He's speaking to the bond here of relationship. The bond of a father and son, the bond of a father and daughter is so incredibly important. So I would ask you, in your wisdom of love, knowing how love operates, how was your bond with your father? Did he create that bond by which love is taught and wisdom would grow? And then he says, tender and the only one in the sight of my mother, there is a focused Love of attention, my mother saw me and was tender with me. Growing up, did you feel seen? 
did you feel the tender, nurturing bond growing up? It's out of this instruction and wisdom happen. Because without the loving bond, instruction is just a lecture. Without the loving bond, then correction is just the rod without relationship. That bond is everything. He also taught me in verse number four and said to me, let your heart retain my words. Notice all the focus is heart to heart connection to experiencing knowledge. He says, get wisdom, get understanding. Don't forget, don't turn away from the words of my mouth. So part of the father-mother relationship is learning to teach the treasure of certain words, the importance of them, taking time to marinate on them, experiencing them. This takes discussion. This takes time. This isn't just sitting and, you know, zoning out. This is actual conversation. This is actual connection, investment here. Do not forsake her. And it's amazing how in Proverbs, in in Solomon's writing, he brings out how wisdom is personified as a female. And I believe one of the reasons it's brought about in that way is that there be a loving pursuit. As a man would pursue a female and, and his heart longs for her and he goes after her and pursues her, The Bible is saying in that same way, we need to have a loving pursuit of wisdom to grow in it and treasure it. When you love and go after a woman, you treasure that time. It's like time freezes. You're taken in by her beauty. When you're with her, you don't want to leave. You, it's like time just holds still because you just want to take in the moment. Don't forsake her. She will preserve you. Love her and she will keep you. In, in Solomon's instruction, this is what he learned growing up. Now, I don't know about you and me. Don't know if we got this from our upbringings. <laughs> it's okay. We're learning to grow in this and provide this to the next generation. Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. In all you're getting, get understanding. To just grow. Exalt her and she will promote you. She will bring you honor when you embrace her. She will place on your head an ornament of grace, a crown of glory she will deliver to you. My my thought that I want to share with you is the loss of wisdom we see in society because culturally people are becoming more shallow, more immature in how they're manifesting things, and the truth is being exchanged for a lie. What's the solution? It goes back to the fundamental work of family, father and mother, to build wisdom. Now, fathers and mothers, they were not necessarily given the wisdom they need, so they've got to discover it. So we've got to first learn wisdom ourselves, grow in maturity ourselves, so we now have something to offer and to bring because we're growing ourselves. Hear my son, receive my sayings, and the years of your life will be many. I've taught you in the way of wisdom. I have led you in the right paths. Please understand, folks, We're in a place in the world system where there is a wrestling and a tension against the wisdom of God to dismiss the ways and wisdom of God and to keep us from the power of the true understanding for what love needs in any given moment. Listen to what is said here in verse 12. When you walk, your steps will not be hindered. When you run, you will not stumble. Here, see the words of a parent here, guiding them about walking, guiding them about running. Take In verse 13, take firm hold of instruction. Do not let go. Keep her, for she is your life. Do not enter the path of the wicked and do not walk in the way of evil. Avoid it. Don't travel on it. Turn away from it and pass on. For they do not sleep unless they've done evil and their sleep is taken away unless they make someone fall. For they eat the bread of wickedness. They drink the wine of violence. But the path of the just is like the shining sun that shines ever bright ever brighter unto the dark, the, unto the perfect day. The way of the wicked is like darkness. They do not know what makes, them sum, what makes them stumble. My son, give attention to my words. Incline your ear to my saying. So this leads me to say, are, are fathers giving time to speak words of life and instruction and understanding? Because out of this is a manifestation of verse 21. 
that I'm going to take this wisdom. I'm not going to let it depart from my eyes. I'm going to keep it in front of me so that it becomes a guiding force. There are life to those who find him, health to all your flesh. And verse 23 is a dear, dear passage of scripture. I've spoken about, I have, I have videos just on this verse. Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it spring the issues of life. Mother and father were watching over the heart of their children. And in this case, watching over their son to pour into his life, to help him and to give him references. They give him references and examples and understanding so he could walk it and live it. Solomon did not just all of a sudden on his own experience all these things. These were invested in him from the early days of his youth in the recognition of the importance of watching over your heart. Put away from you a deceitful mouth and perverse lips from you. They taught him the importance of his words. Let your eyes look straight ahead and your eyelids right before you. So they're, they're walking with him through every aspect, pondering the path of your feet in verse 26. And let all your ways be established. Listen to this. Do not turn to the right or the left. How many of us are just scrambling left and right, double-minded, triple-minded, quadruple-minded, Right? because we need wisdom. The good news is the Bible says, if anyone lacks wisdom, he can ask of God and he gives it to you. And we've got some healing to work through because wisdom wasn't necessarily established in our hearts. So we give into counterfeits of love. Sometimes we think love is lust. We think it's a rush. It's a burst. Oh, we need, and we taste that rush. We taste that feeling. And we realize we need to get grounded in another way. That love is much deeper. It's not lust. Speaking of lust, in the proverb writing, this establishment then leads to the instruction of wisdom in being able to watch out for the pathways of seduction that will want to come his way and take him off the path of purity and off the path that is available to him. So my encouragement to you today is that each of us would be able to grow in the wisdom of what love needs in a given moment. And so I ask you in closing, I'm going to continue this series in further videos. We're going to go into why is love the greatest, what love looks like in given situations. We're going to talk about what love is not. We're going to talk about um, sometimes the tendency we have to fix people. What is, what is selfishness? How does that get in the way? What does, it, what does it look like to experience love in greater measure? This is going to be an expanding and expanding journey of discovery. But today, the question I have to you is very simple. What would wisdom lead you into? What's the deeper aspect of love that God's calling you to understand, to deepen, to strengthen, and enrich your relationship world? And I pray that wisdom will come so that you can abound more in all knowledge and discernment, and that love will grow in massive capacity in your life. And so for me, it's been a joy to present this with you, and I look forward to continuing this further. If these episodes have been a blessing to your life, go to markdehesus.com, and you can support with a one-time donation or with regular support on a monthly basis. It's a pleasure and it's an honor to be able to pour into your life and to encourage your healing and freedom journey. Many blessings to you. Look forward to seeing you next time.